The adjective occult originated in the 1530s from the Middle French occulte and directly from Latin occultus, the past participle of oculare, from the assimilated form of ob, meaning over, and calare, meaning to hide, in turn deriving from the Phoenician root kel, meaning to conceal. The association of this term with meaning not apprehended by the mind, beyond the range of understanding, stems from the 1540s, presumably from the publication in that decade of Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa's Berengo's Italic edition of Operum Pars Posterios, the second part of his collected works. It was not until the 1870s, with the writing of, and in particular 1888, with the first publication of, H. P. Blavatsky's work, The Secret Doctrine, that the term occultism entered the popular English vernacular, the same year in which occlude became the term for a certain condition in modern medical dentistry. Although apparently introduced into Latin only as recently as the early 15th century AD, the term occultation, from Latin occultatio, the noun of action from the past participle stem of occultare, frequentative of oculare, meaning disguising one's identity, has attached itself to additional meaning by being used as the modern translation of the Arabic word geba, a term that has had an important role in the religious beliefs of Shia Islam since at least 874. From around this time, the vanishing of the 12th Imam, Muhammad al-Madhai al-Mujah, began being referred to by Sheikh Abu Abdullah Muhammad bin Ibrahim bin Jafar al-Khatib and Numani by the noun Gaib and the form one active participle verb Gaib, both of which terms derive from the Arabic root term Gaib relating to absence. This Arabic term, G-Y-B, may be derived from the earlier Hebrew word gabar, G-B-R, a verb meaning to become mighty, from whence the modern Hebrew term gibor, an adjective meaning strong, derives although it is also likely both gabar and gibor derive from the earlier term gab, translated eminent, but relating also to gibah, the Hebrew proper locative noun for the word hill. In its utmost of arcane origins, the notion of occultism should be directly corresponded to the 21st century B.C., Egyptian deity of the Theban triad, Amun, whose name, written I-M-N, means invisible or hidden one, which word is, even today, recited as the Greek Amun. At the end of every Christian prayer, where it has come to mean, so be it. The distinction between superior religion, and inferior occultism, dates back to at least the Babylonian Code of Hammurabi, circa 2000 BC. At that time, the Baru priest and the Ashipu priest were sanctioned to recite the incantations of magical formularies. The Sherpu, a burnt offering spell, the Maklu, banishing spells by witches and wizards. The Atuki Lamuti, 16 formulae to ward off ghosts and demons. 
the Asaski Marsuti, a series of twelve spells against fever and sickness, the nine TE tablets to cure headaches, and the Labartu incantations, repeated over a wax figure symbolizing the patient to drive away ogres and witches from children. But there were also unsanctioned practitioners of these arts who were called Keshapi. In the second law of Hammurabi's code, the ordeal of water is prescribed for any accuser and accused party. In cases wherein there is no material evidence available for proof, the accused was sentenced to drown and their property to go to their accuser. But if the accused survived the ordeal, their accuser was put to death and all their property went to the accused. In the concurrent events described in the book of Deuteronomy, in the Hebrew Torah or Christian Old Testament, chapter 18, verses 10 and 11, the wandering Hebrew nation following the exodus out of Egypt are exhorted against the abominable ways and evil doings of the contemporary inhabitants of Canaan, the land the Hebrews planned to next invade and conquer. This passage of the Holy Scripture reads, There shall not be found among you any who that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or is an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. Thus, the distinction between sanctioned religion and unsanctioned occultism originally pivoted around their shared use of superstitious magic, which, although nowadays defined by Catholic theologians as the art of performing actions beyond the power of man with the aid of powers other than the divine, has as equally well been defined by actual practitioner of ancient magic in modern times, Aleister Crowley, as simply enough, the science and art of causing change to occur in conformity with will. So, if we take the common English usage for the term occult as referring to secret or esoteric knowledge of the paranormal and supernatural, and consider the content of this knowledge to be in regards to all extant literature describing the superstitions of magic, inclusive from ancient to modern times, then we may truly unveil and denude the role of the modern occultist as like a latter-day magus, one of those magi wizards of the Persian Zoroastrians not less than 2,000 years ago, or even as a living embodiment of the most ancient role of shamanic medicine man, a healer and elder advisor to the earliest hominid tribes. Although the role of this first shaman was arguably simpler than the work of the modern occultist, which is likewise relatively more complex, considering there has been by now much more information accumulated that one is required to study and learn to be considered a master in this field. So, to understand what constitutes today's occult, we must study the history of magic. Superstitious magic as an act of fetishistic transference and psychological projection alike exteriorly displaces the locus of control and responsibility for outcomes and consequences in one's own life. Again, when sanctioned, this process of surrender to a higher power is called religion and considered to imbue one with an improved moral sensibility. However, when practiced independently or clandestinely and not sanctioned by the proper authorities, the same acts, however beneficially intended, may be seen as being a cult. 
the earliest practices of what we can consider today to be such superstitious magic most likely included cave paintings such as those found in Lascaux, France and elsewhere across Neolithic era Europe ritualized disposal of the dead possibly learned from cohabitation with Neanderthals in Kevara cave in modern Israel occupied Palestine and early agrarian seasonal festivals which may explain the petroglyphs of Gobikli tape as early astronomical observation markers it is widely considered plausible in current academia that England's Stonehenge known to have been built from 3000 to 2000 BC served as an ancient astronomical observatory for measuring exact changes to the skyline throughout the years decades centuries and millennia etc subsequent geoglyphic and megalithic monuments from the Giza necropolis in Egypt built around 4,500 years ago to Teotihuacan, Mexico built 2,000 years ago can clearly be compared to certain astronomical features such as in both these cases to the three king stars of the constellation Orion's belt the development of magic throughout the old world or pre-christian times was related to the rise and fall of empires based around such megalithic building projects and tied to the superstitious displacement of consequences for one's own actions onto fetishized objects in the form of at first human although eventually mostly animal ritualistic sacrificial slaughter the efficacy of such superstitious magic as a means of hypnotic mass mind control contoured seamlessly with the pantheism of the era when the climate was mild philosophers found leisure time and in vino veritas however during the European Dark Ages that mini ice age of the so-called modern sunspot minimum the impetus toward monumental works programs was waning wars plagues and famines swept the land and the dissatisfaction with contemporary ethics finally culminated in 1517 with German theology professor Martin Luther nailing a list of his 95 theses or moral complaints against the Roman Catholic Papal Church of his day to the door of the All Saints Church in Wittenberg so this monotheistic trend of ethics and morality gradually encroaching on previously pantheist hedonic and even thalamic ritual magic ceremonies was evident from the lifetime of Jesus the so-called Christ put to human sacrifice on the crucifix according to the Roman legends continuing on through the lifetime of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him who was also hounded in his time by unbelievers and jealous sheiks but whom escaped their clutches to write the glorious Quran and rightly establish the five pillars of Islam through even Martin Luther's Reformation era when the newly invented movable block type printing press ushered in a new age of literacy for the masses until finally it swept westward across the Atlantic Ocean to establish a new Atlantis as envisioned for America by Sir Francis Bacon through triangular trade slavery genocide of the indigenous native tribes people and ultimately by using counterfeit currency to fund an industrial revolution from the 1820s onward using the labor of wage slaves as magic's curious luster became dulled and moralized and its craft ever more housebroken to social ethics its use of materiality for the mass manufacture of symbolic or fetish objects usually called toys or art has hyperinflated 
and its focus on the supernatural and paranormal has taken a passenger seat beside this agenda. Enter then the 20th century Magus, Aleister Crowley, 1875-1947, to whom sought to achieve Samadhi without living a renunciant and ascetic lifestyle, whom sought to prove that, even in the hustle and bustle, the din and throngs of an urban polity, one may yet attain selfless communion within a divine rapture, whom sought to prove that gluttony, sloth, greed, and guile were not disgraces enough to bar one from penetrating the depths of nature's great mystery. One may take or leave Crowley's own life as one wishes. His works will remain as stepping stones to be used however anyone wills. This catches us up to the 21st century AD and to the information superhighway, the internet, on which you are probably receiving these words and using which I am transmitting them. The World Wide Web is certainly a culmination of many millennia of magical works, not the least of which include the 20th century Golden Dawn's flying rolls, Florence Farr's spherical projection model of Hakabalah, and even S.L. Mather's work on John D. and Edward Kelly's obtuse Enochian magic system. Now that we have provided some background for the term occult, and for the history of superstitious magic up to the present moment, let us next face the moral and ethical riddle encapsulating the question, what will the future of occult magic be? Assuming it may be whatever we wish it to be, given our finite resources with which to build it, then what do we want the future of the occult and of magic to be? Let's look at this question from another angle. Should occult magic writers and artists personally prosper for distributing their occult magic works? Or, put more succinctly, who would pay to read any of this? As once quipped by the Christian Messiah, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and unto God what is God's. Mark 12:17, Luke 20:25, 20, and as he also admonished in his Sermon on the Mount, cast not pearls before swine. Matthew 7:6. So let us flip this coin of chance and see on which of these sides it lands. Should we adhere to, as the Kibalian would claim? keeping milk for babes, meat for strong men? Or should we aspire to, as Martin Luther would advise us, sin boldly, but let our trust in Christ be stronger? For surely to play at this role of Rumpelstiltskin and weave a fool's grasping at straw into philosophical gold has been cautioned against in so many words by Christ's admonishment of Luke the Evangelist, Cura te ipsum, meaning in Latin, heal thyself. And again, in his parable of the moat and the beam, Matthew 7, 1 through 5, Luke 6, 37 through 42, and confer the Gospel of Thomas, aphorism 26. Again, we are reminded of the folly of chasing that dragon Mammon by Father Christian Rosenkreutz, first article of constitutions for his Fraternity of the Rose Cross from Fama Fraternitatis, that none of them should profess any other thing than to cure the sick and that gratis. Would a true doctor sell their patient medicine to save their life? Or, seen differently, would a true doctor withhold medicine that would save their patient's life if they had not yet paid for it in full? But then again, how truly medical 
or occult magic and related metaphysics as a cure for melancholia or an unsettled mind. In most cases, it is not any deep philosophical truth contained in the mumbo-jumbo mutterings of these madding pseudo-scientists, but solely soulless snake oil they sell, preying on the weak minds of those who crave for any, even a false, hope. If the summum bonum of the great work were truly the law of attraction, there would be very many more successful people than there are. So, when is occult magic literature and art an inherent good in itself, and when should it be seen as being at its best value to the broader community? According to the subject of theory of value, the activity of valuation of any object from the newest electronic consumer commodity to a weathered pebble from some far distant rivulet, is ultimately arbitrary and left entirely up to the unpredictable impulse control of the person who is psychologically projecting their own personal values onto the object. In other words, no real value is innate in nature, and all apparent values are only assigned to objects by different people for different reasons at different times. Thus, the concept of value in general is rendered essentially meaningless and moot. However, according to a different school of economics, use value constitutes the most efficient and beneficial measure for applying possible attachment to any object. Whether this act of valuation is taken by an individual or by any group. Use value, or more particularly, social use value, that is, technology applied to modeling a demonstrably real phenomenon, may be considered the lesser evil between the absolute existential exile of subjective value and itself as the relative security posited by the presence of other objects with objective traits, etc. However, even this appearance of usefulness as a value may be deceptive and prove false in time. For example, a weapon has use value to a warrior, but a tool has such to a worker, and so to a toy for a child. What use has a warrior for a toy in battle? or has a worker with a weapon when it comes time to do their job, or a child have for a tool meant for the easement of labors that their own young mind has never imagined, let alone experienced yet in their short life. Thus, ultimately, although it is an available option for a method of measuring value, even usefulness remains subjective. And so far as my own personal opinion on this issue should not be seen as being any more nor any less important than that of anyone else's, and, being as it is convenient for me to do so, please allow me to, lastly, offer my own estimation of when occult magical literature and art is at its best, and when it has the greatest value to the community as a whole. From my experience, occult magical literature and art is best and most valuable to the community when it is syncretic. That is, when it combines various disparate religious motifs together into a harmoniously unified continuity. When Erasmus said, Concord is a mighty rampart, in April 1519, referring to his modernizing the term syncretism in his adages published in the winter of 1517 and 1518, he very likely meant to attribute the significance of this term to its originator, Plutarch, 1st century AD, who wrote about the example of the syncretism, literally translated as Union of Cretans, and fraternal love of the people of Crete, who, when faced with an exterior danger, readily set aside their dogmatisms 
and doctrinal differences to face the threat head on, side by side, in much the same honorific manner as Isaac Newton once stated in a 1676 letter to Robert Hooke, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants, referring, in Newton's case, to the prior philosophers of physics, including Euclid and Democritus, of course, but no less so Galileo Galilei and Nicholas Copernicus. Therefore, I advocate such syncretism in the literature and art of occult magic, and I do so intending it as progress toward a new age understanding of religion, combining all past schools of thought on those matters into one holistic monism. In this sense, I posit, along with Mahatma Mohandas Gandhi, on February 10, 1940, that this concept of religion means a belief in ordered moral government of the universe. It harmonizes sectarian religions and gives them reality. In the end, we are each unique, and so, as well as with magical practices, what works best for one individual will almost certainly fail if applied identically by any other. What one person values, another despises, and what the first person passionately hates, the other will, just as blindly, love. So it goes between all people. Our external relationships form a larger fractal of cogs and gears that is, in turn, comprised of the smaller identical fractal cogs within cogs and gears within gears of each of our own interior psychological deus ex machinae. As is said, the wheels of justice turn slowly, but grind exceedingly fine. So let these thoughts be digested in your mind over time, and draw your own conclusions from all this the best that you are able. Should we prophets turn a prophet or not off it, with students or without, a true teacher will always be teaching their most obscure and obfuscated fables.